Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for Women Talk Money. My name is Michelle Tessier, generally behind the scenes, but today very excited to host this conversation that I hope is going to help all of us. Today, we are talking about all things retirement, specifically how it differs for women and what we can do to prepare and secure our future and just feel confident that we're headed in the right direction. Um, I am joined by two wonderful colleagues and regulars here at Women Talk Money, Gina Gillespie, Vice President and Financial Consultant based out of our Investor Center in Burlington, Massachusetts, and Alex Roca, Workplace Financial Consultant based down in South Florida. So thank you both for joining us. I know we have so much to cover. So let's get into the conversation. And we do have so much to talk about, Gina. So let's maybe set the table and just kind of cover some of the basics. What are some of the things we need to be taking into account when we're planning for retirement? Thank you, Michelle. I'm so excited to do this topic today because as a financial professional, I spend day in and day out with individuals trying to help them to think about the future. And with, I know on this call, we have participants of all different ages, people who are maybe thinking I'm too young to think about retirement to I'm in retirement right now. And so a big piece, even if we're far away, I think it's always good to visualize and think about what you want it to look like for you. Maybe I want to live near family. I want to travel the world. I'd always wanted to have two homes. I think it's always great to visualize or write down goals like that. Because as we talk through a savings vehicles and ways to efficiently do these things, it's good to kind of have something in mind at the end. It's also good to have flexibility. I very rarely have ever met with an individual where nothing's changed in their situation. I've been in our office for almost 13 years and worked with many of the same clients and things change. So it's really good to be able to modify your goals because, you know, in life curveballs happen. But we oftentimes find that women have maybe some more hurdles than other people for many reasons when it comes to retirement planning. So I'm really excited to share some of those things today. So what does that what does that mean? Well, oftentimes in retirement, because of longevity, it's 20 or 30 years. We want to make sure you're comfortable in those years. And women oftentimes live six years on average longer than men. So we're thinking about living longer we might need more money to live off of or more expenses in healthcare too. So those are some topics I always like to think through together. Women actually spend an average of $165,000 on healthcare and retirement and men, the average number is 150,000. So we need more, right? So that's something I always love to kind of focus on. Another is that there is a gender gap, right? Or there's a, a pay gap in, ter in terms of gender. And we oftentimes find we might have to save a little bit harder or more efficiently. So Alex and I are going to talk a lot about efficiencies today in savings and how we can help with that. We want you to make sure you're, you're smart with your money, right? And we'll help you to prepare for those things. And then lastly, women tend to take off more leave to help care for family, sick spouses, parents. So that leave time can oftentimes create a little gap of savings too. So when we think about kind of the hope and purpose of today, like I'm excited to talk about all these things because I know there's some hurdles, but we're going to talk through all those. Awesome. Thank you. So we're going to talk about the how, but let's start with, I'm going to say the million dollar question, maybe literally, maybe not. Alex, how do you know how much you should be saving for retirement? And how do you know if you're on track? So this is actually the number one question that we hear every day. And the answer is always it depends, which I know can sound so frustrating, but there is no magic number, no amount or even age that you need to retire at. So there are so many factors that it can depend on. You need to ask yourself, what are your predictable expenses? What lifestyle do you envision for yourself in retirement? Kind of what Gina said, paint that picture. Are you traveling? Are you visiting family? Are you, I don't know, taking up golf? Whatever it is, what is that going to look like? And then also ask yourself, what are your predictable sources of income? Is your income gonna come from social security, pensions, other retirement? accounts. This is really important because then you have to look at the difference between these two. Will your expenses exceed your savings? I love that you said that, Alex. I'd love to jump in because I'll have individuals come in. You'll talk about this with family and friends, right? And they'll say, I heard I need a million dollars. I heard I need two million dollars. And we're like, well, well, hold on a second. Really, there's no 
one number. It's really dependent on what you need. So our fidelity, you know, a big piece of fidelity that we look at is we really usually need between 55 to 80 percent of your income in retirement because generally we try not to have a mortgage. Your children aren't there any longer, most likely. We're not contributing to retirement plans. It really depends on how much you spend and what you'd like to do. So I think your sweet spot or the personalization of this is really dependent on how much you make now and what you saved and what you'd like to do. Fidelity has some really great resources. One of my favorites is our retirement score tool. So you'll put in some data information, money you've saved, how, long, how much you're saving, et cetera, and it'll tell you, are you on track? I think it's a really great way to kind of give you a gauge, even if you're further away. Agreed. And I also like it. It gives you that kind of red, yellow, green to give you kind of a sense too, in addition to the number. So I like a good, good calculator, good widget. So check that out. No, okay. So that's, it's the visual that makes you feel better. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Hopefully you're, you're more in the green. Um, if not, the, it'll tell you how to get there. That's the other thing. And it's nice to tease up steps based on the answers that you give. So it, it can be a helpful helpful tool. So, but that leads to kind of a natural next question. How do you estimate your expenses in retirement? I know we're talking about the 55 to 80, but how do you estimate? Gina, can you double back on that? So there's many different ways I'd love to. Um, so I, as a financial professional, I sit in this office with clients every day and we're sitting and we're coming up with these numbers. Everyone's situation is different. I know I keep saying that, but everyone spends differently. So I'd like to think about, so if you're trying to get an idea of spending, where's the money going? So think about things also that may change in retirement. So will you have a mortgage still or rent, food, healthcare expenses? Those are like, as I think about kind of these things, what are the things that you pay for today? And what are the things we may not pay for? So then I, we always try to break them down into different categories, right? So we'll have essential, discretionary, and then I like to throw in maybe expenses you've seen in the last year or two years or three years, unexpected expenses. I know in my household, there's always things that happen in our home. So I always put in each year, I'm probably going to spend X on, you know, just upkeep or things like that. And then something else happens, right? So I always like to make sure we have an unexpected category. Think about the essentials as like, it can be just things like to keep the lights on and pay all the necessary bills, but I also like to throw in non-negotiable things that you want and need in retirement. And then the discretionary are that I'd like to do them, but it wouldn't really matter to me. You know, uh, Michelle, I think a big piece is a non-negotiable for me would be, I would definitely want to make sure I can do the things I'd like to do. Maybe it's having lunch with my girlfriends or things like that. That's like a non-negotiable. I wouldn't want to just sit at home, you know. So those are things, when you think of essential, add in there the non-negotiables. Thanks. I know this is always a big question. How do you estimate? How do you estimate for healthcare? How do you estimate for retirement as a whole? So I think um, we're going to talk in a little bit more about how working with someone like you or Alex, what that experience is like and how that can help. So we'll get back to that. But Alex, maybe let's get into the actual steps. We've talked about kind of the what you need to think about. Let's talk about the how. Is there a roadmap or sort of, I'm going to tee this right up. Is there a roadmap or some sort of guideline that we can follow about how much you're saving and when. When you think about saving for retirement, the first thing that often comes to mind is people's employees or employer workplace plans. Think like your 401k, your 403b, those kinds of things. And that's great. But there are more steps that you can take to stack up your savings. Now, we're going to share what we call the savings hierarchy, but specific to retirement. So in terms of what you're saving and in what kind of accounts. We're going to talk through six steps and questions that you can ask yourself to help optimize your retirement savings plan. And that way, you have more money to tuck away, you know, and you know how to prioritize it. Now, remember that the strategies can change based on your different goals. So today we're talking about how to save and invest for retirement. But if you're planning for other goals, the hierarchy may be a little different. And if that's the case for you, just give us a call and we can help you figure out what the right path is for your specific goal. Now, let's start by helping you get tax smart savings and investment strategies for retirement. So as we go through these six steps, one thing I just want to call out, we're going to show this in literal steps that stack on top of each other. Talk about one, then two, then three. Now, if one of them doesn't apply to you, don't worry, we just move on to the next one. 
Um, but these are kind of, you know, the order of what you want to think about as far as where do you put your next savings dollar to maximize your retirement savings. So Alex, let's, um, I think you're really just with step one, building on what you just started talking about. Can you add on to that? Of course. If you have a retirement plan through your employer, so again, your 401k, 403b, make sure that you open and start contributing to your plan right away. Even if you've been with your employer for a while and haven't done it, make sure that you're doing that. Because one of the things you're going to want to make sure is that you understand what your company matches you on, right? So your employer may actually provide money into your 401k on a yearly basis. So if you're putting money into the account, they're putting money into the account as well. Now, this is free money that's going towards your retirement goal. Now, this amount might be a percentage of your contributions, a percentage of your salary, or it can be a certain dollar amount. So once you find out your policy, do the math to understand how much you need to contribute to reach your employer's match. Next, how long do you need to work there to keep the money that your employer has provided? This is often called your vesting period. Any money, this is important to know, any money that you put into your workplace retirement account is yours. So if you put in $100 today and you leave tomorrow, that $100 is yours. But the money your company gives you, they may have a specific amount of time that you need to work for them in order to keep the money that they've provided. Now, once that contribution has fully vested, it is yours forever. Now, Fidelity does believe that you should contribute at least enough to get your employer's match. Again, that's free money going towards your retirement. And if you don't, that's free money you're leaving on the table. I like that. Free money. Okay, so we're contributing to our workplace retirement savings plan, at least up to the match if you're eligible. Um, what if you don't have that match or once, once you're hitting the company match, what's the next step? Gina, can you build on that? Yeah, I think that sounds great. I, I First instinct, you'd say, okay, where's the next place I'm saving for retirement? And you'd think about maybe another retirement plan of some sort. But step two is actually around house savings accounts and HSAs. So consider contributing to your house savings account or HSA to the maximum. And so there's really a lot that goes into something called a health savings account. And we're going to talk about it. We spend a lot of time talking about Women Talk Money because there's still a lot of people out there who either aren't aware of these accounts or if they're eligible. So let's talk a little bit about that. It can be really valuable because one of the things we find that we spend a lot of money on in retirement is healthcare. So an HSA allows you to save and invest for healthcare costs. You can use it today or in the future, which is so nice because it's flexible. It, the caveat is you must be enrolled in a high deductible, so an eligible high deductible healthcare plan. So one of the things that we think about with an HSA plan is that it has triple tax savings or tax advantages. Your contributions can reduce your overall taxable income today. So you put money in and it reduces that taxable income. Your contributions aren't taxed while they're in the account, so it's growing, it's tax deferred. That means even if we earn interest and growth in there, we're not getting a tax bill on this. So we call this tax-free potential earnings. And then we don't owe any taxes when we take it out for qualified medical expenses. So again, save now, get a tax deduction, it grows, and we can take it out either we need it now or later um, tax-free. So when I think about these health savings account, the most important thing I think that we think about is that healthcare is just a big, but it has a big kind of um, expense inside of our retirement plan. So not having to pay taxes on those qualified medical expenses can be a plus. Maybe you want to retire earlier, so you're worried about how you're going to pay for that in healthcare. So I think health savings accounts, when you think about it, the money that you can accumulate over time can really help you to be efficient and have that bucket of money that you can use for those long, those uh, longer term goals or those longer term things in retirement. Great. So you can open if you are in an HSA eligible health plan, you can open us through your employer in many cases. But what if your employer doesn't offer an HSA? Are, are there great, options for that? That's a great question because we get that all the time. Fidelity has an HSA plan that you can open within within Fidelity. And you have to be enrolled again in a high deductible healthcare plan, but you can open the Fidelity plan here and it allows you to save as well as grow the, those dollars. Um, you know, I said it before that 
on average, women spend more than men on healthcare expenses. And so it's a really great way to, again, save for later. So make sure as you look through that you don't have a, health, a HSA plan offered through your employer. If you don't, you can open on here. Great. Thank you. Okay. We're going to keep going. Alex, what's the next way to save? Step three. So let's come back to the workplace retirement account, your 401k or 403b. We want you to consider maxing out your 401k. And I know this can be a little confusing. I see this quite often when I'm meeting with people. I'm sure, Gina, that you have the same experience where because we know there are so many different types of accounts, we feel like we're supposed to do all of them. No, we don't, right? We don't have to complicate our portfolio. We can actually just max out what we already have in place. And when you consider that for 2024, the regular contribution into a 401k was $23,000 and $69,000 for the combined employee and employer contributions, there's really not a lot. Uh, we can say that another account is going to provide that the workplace account will not provide. Now, if you're over the age of 50, you can actually do an additional 7500 of a tax advantage contribution for a total of $30,500 that you can put into your workplace plan. Now, I do want to make this comment. If you are using a solo 401k, that's a little bit of a different vehicle, so the contribution limits may be different. Keep that in mind. Now, we usually talk about contributions as a specific percentage of your earnings, but because of the gender pay gap, women are often earning a little bit less. So in turn, that could mean that our contributions can also be lower. This is one of the reasons why it may make sense for us to aim for that maximum allowed contribution limit. So the numbers we were just going over. Now, that's a huge number. So if you can't afford to go all the way up to the maximum, Fidelity suggests that you save 15% of your free tax salary, but this does include your employer's match. So if your employer gives you a 3%, then you can put in a 12% for that total 15% recommended. And if that still feels like it's a little too high right now because life is expensive, contribute what you can. Try to get at least to that match so you don't leave any free money on the table and then commit to adding just 1% more every year. 1% of $1,000 is $10 just to bring it to life, right? So it's not a big difference if we just go up 1% each year until you can get to that 15%. We've shared that 1% rule. That, that works for any account you're saving in. Those little bits add up. And um, we, we, we don't have them here, but we have some graphs. I mean, everybody's like, does it really? Does it really? But it over time, you know, you're, you're investing for the long term. Retirement for most of us is still a ways away. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a really great tip. So thank you for reiterating that. What about people who don't have an employer plan to save in, but they can save in retirement as well? So where does that come into in the savings hierarchy? Gina, I'm going to ask you to go there. It's a great question. Remember, one of the first things you said, Michelle, was you don't have to, if you, there's, some of these may not apply to you. So if you don't have a 401k or a 403b plan, you know, that's a, that's a, it's okay, right? We, we can go and we can look at your search and situation. I know we sound like a broken record, but call some one of us, we can help you to figure out what to do. So the next step in the hierarchy though, is to consider contributing to an IRA, right? So you don't need an employer plan for this. This is an individual retirement account. It can be a Roth IRA, a traditional or a rollover up to the maximum. So you don't need to be connected to an employer. So if you're self-employed, this may be an option that you'd prefer, right? I can still save here. Can, you can also, if you have a 401k or 403b plan, I want to throw it in there. This can just be an additional way to save on top of the workplace savings. So again, just know that this can be something that you can still do. And they're 100% yours. They're not tied to anyone else or like an employer. There's several different options and benefits. And you can contribute to, I always look at this, number one, number two, number three, like on our hierarchy, right? And go above and beyond. But we have to make sure we have under the certain IRS earned income limits. So that may prohibit us from, from adding to, to some of those as well. If you're, so you had just mentioned, Michelle, everyone, you know, what, are the, what are the numbers? How much can we contribute? Again, I'll share if you're under 50, in 2024, you can put in $7,000 to an IRA or a Roth IRA. If you're 50 or over, you can do another thousand. So that's $8,000. If 
Again, don't have to memorize this. It's going to be in a lot of the pieces that we'll attach or send out. So if you're a small business owner, I know that was the question you asked, Michelle, um, you, and you work for yourself, you can add to these plans. It may be a good option for you. There's also different types of IRAs that you can add to that it's not listed in this hierarchy, but it's you may have heard of a SEP IRA, a simple IRA. I know that Alex mentioned a solo 401k, if that's something you hadn't heard of but want to learn more, let us know. Those can all help to really minimize your tax tax burden while you're working. And you can often have a little bit higher contribution limits than a traditional or a Roth IRA. If you decide that the IRA is right for you, you'll have the option of an account where you can choose to invest the assets yourself or have a professional do it for you. But remember, if you choose the do-it-yourself approach, make sure to actually choose your investments. We've heard stories of people thinking that they were done once they established the account, once they funded the account and put, put the contribution into it, and they didn't realize until much later that they actually needed to then invest the money. Unlike your workplace accounts where that happens automatically, in an IRA, you actually have to take that step and invest those assets. So call us. Even if you just want to check to make sure that you did things the right way or you want to just reassure that you're on the right track, call us because we can we can answer that for you. Great. Alex, there are a lot of questions about IRAs, asking about traditional IRAs, Roth IRAs. Can you talk a little bit more about those options? Absolutely. Let's actually start with the rollover IRA because I think that's one that you may not be as familiar with and it's related to your workplace plan. So I want you to think of the rollover IRA as its biggest job is just to help you keep track of all your old employer plans. Now, it's important to note two things, right? One, the money that rolls into your IRA doesn't count towards your yearly contribution, right? So, so those numbers Gina was talking about, that 7,000, if you're rolling over an old work place plan, it is not going to count towards that contribution limit. And two, the rollover itself does not cause a taxable event. So if we move money from an old 401k into that rollover IRA, we are not going to have to pay taxes because it's still inside a retirement account. Now, one more thing, a lot of people don't realize this, but you can technically still put money into a rollover IRA. So in addition to whatever you roll over, you could put more money into that rollover IRA. However, while you can add money to it, this does limit what you can do with the account. So make sure that you talk to a professional and you really understand your options so that you're, you're sure of what comes next. Now, when we talk about the Roth IRA versus the traditional IRA, those are terms we've heard a little bit more about. There are still some several, uh, there are still several differences between these, but the main one is how and when your money is going to be taxed. The Roth accepts after-tax money. So the Roth IRA is going to accept after-tax money, which means that you pay the taxes on your contributions now as you put them into your account versus in retirement when you start to withdraw them. And this can also be true for the earnings within the account. However, you cannot deduct your contributions come tax time. For the traditional IRA, you can deduct your contributions at tax time, which means you won't be paying taxes on the amount that you contribute on the year that you contribute it. But you will have to pay taxes on the money when you take it out in retirement. And this is going to be true both for the contribution and any of the earnings in that account. So something to consider is what tax bracket do you think you'll be in during retirement? Will you be in a higher tax bracket or a lower tax bracket than you are right now? There is no right or wrong answer. And if you're not sure, call us or fill out the form and we're happy to help you walk through some of the options. Remember that this is a big topic, so you may also want to talk to your tax advisor about what the right option is for you. I was going to say, Alex, I feel like the question about what tax bracket you're going to be in, that is a, that's a hard thing to guess. Wow. Or yes. think through. So that's where talking to someone can help. Okay, back to our steps. Let's say someone is killing it. They've already done everything on the list, or at least what applies to them. Gina, what else can we be doing? This is where we get into the what else section of the discussion. I, I love this next one. Alex and I work with so many different individuals. I think our goal is always to share things that you might not know about. So the next one can really help a lot of individuals in retirement. They may not know about this. Look into adding after-tax money 
into your 401k or other eligible options that would be offered by your employer. So what does that mean? Inside, when you go to contributions, you might see pre-tax, Roth, or after-tax contributions. And Alex mentioned earlier about the contribution limits to the workplace plan. Do you remember when she said $69,000? So let's talk a little bit about this. You may be able to contribute even more using this after-tax bucket. So what does that mean? You can contribute more than just your individual limit. So that 69,000 means that what the employer put in, what you put in up to that 23,000 of a max, right, of those other contributions, on top of that, anything the difference between that and 69,000, you can do more after-tax contributions to get you to that limit. And if you're over age 50, you can add another 7,500. So that actually gets us up to $76,500. So again, pre-tax, Roth, or look for after-tax contributions too to max out to that either $69,000 or $76,500. And another good thing about the after-tax contribution is that it can be withdrawn without taxes or penalties at any time because you've already paid the taxes on this amount. As soon as you put the money into the account, you paid the taxes on it, so you'll have access to it right away. There may be some nuances, so make sure that you call us before you do that withdrawal. And keep in mind that there are several potential strategies for what to do with that after-tax 401k contribution. One of those strategies, commonly known as the Roth and plan conversion, will allow you to convert the after-tax money into your Roth 401k as long as your employer offers that option. And if you consider this, also consider talking to a tax professional. I said it already. I'm going to say it again. When you're dealing with these kinds of transactions, there could be a tax consequence. And you just want to know about it before you take action. You don't want that to be the surprise that you get when you're doing your taxes. Okay, Gina, is the, what? Well, let's keep on this thread of what else can you be doing. Anything yeah. else to add? I think you have some more. I think, it, well, one of the things, so we talk about all these savings pieces and there'll be individual clients will come in, we'll sit down. And one of the maybe unknown or one that you could have heard of, but people don't really always know how to contribute or what it is, is deferred compensation. So highly compensated individuals in, a, in the workforce may have something called deferred compensation offered by your employer. There's eligibility requirements. Each employer can be different. It could be amount of salary you have to earn to be eligible or years of service and, and as well as compensation. So again, if you're not eligible now, you may be in the future. And what they allow you to do is defer compensation, either maybe salary or part of your bonus and defer the taxes today and allow that to be in a bucket of money that you would use in a future date. You can pick a time frame. You could pick retirement as that time frame. You could pick age 60 or 65. So each plan, I'd say this, when we think of deferred compensation, is different. It is very different than your 401k or 403b plan. There are very different rules, but it's another bucket that you can save in in retirement or as you're approaching retirement. And many individuals that I work with who are highly compensated, they're trying to think of other ways that they could reduce their taxes and sometimes they can't go into a traditional IRA and use that as a deduction. So they sit down with Alex and I and say, is there anything else I can do? And deferred compensation may be one of them. So that's one of them that talk to us. Great. Um, I want to backtrack a little bit for just a minute. Before we go on further, you've each talked a little bit about catch-up contributions, generally starting when you turn 50. And I know mm -hmm. a lot of folks have questions about asking about amounts and whatnot. So I think we have a slide. Can we just bring that up that summarizes mm -hmm. some of those opportunities? And Gina, could you tick those off for us? Yeah. So after each 50, if you felt like I have not started at the time frame that I should have, or I didn't save when I was as much as I should have in younger years, we have gov rules that say after age 50, you can add $7,500 more in the 401k, Roth 401k, or employer-based plan. In that really nice health savings account, HSA we talked about, you can add an additional $1,000 if you're over age 50. Traditional or Roth IRA, another $1,000. And then you can see right in front of us too, if you have the simple IRA, that, that employer-based plan, it's another $3,500. You do not need to be a expert in these things. A lot of, if you use Fidelity accounts, we even tell you online, 
we know your age, we'll tell you what your max is that you can contribute each year, and we'll help you keep track of it too if it's here at Fidelity. Thank you for just ticking through them. I think that's really helpful. Okay, we're at step six. So Alex, bring us home on the six steps. So I want to start just by kind of reminding here, first and foremost, that everything we've talked about in this hierarchy today is specifically about planning for retirement. And that's a very specific goal with a very specific strategy. And second, the order of everything here is to help with being tax smart. But after you've done all of this, then it's time to consider investing in general brokerage accounts. You may hear these called as like individual trading accounts is what people usually call them, but we call them brokerage accounts. Now, these won't have the same tax advantages as the retirement accounts that we were discussing previously, but you're still going to have the potential for long-term growth. And not to mention the flexibility of being able to access that money when you need it. There's also no limit to how much you can contribute or invest, so you can keep moving towards that savings goal, even if it's much more than the numbers that Gina and I talked about today. Think of this step as an opportunity to kind of ramp up your savings in general, especially when you think of, you know, when you got a raise or if you know that you're going to get a bonus, a tax refund, a gift, or any kind of windfall, knowing where to put that money and thinking, okay, well, maybe I can't put it into my retirement accounts, but let me make it work hard for me. Let me put it into a brokerage or an individual trading account. It's important to make our money work just as hard as we do. If we only save, we will end up having to save every dollar that we're going to need in retirement. The power of long-term investing. We're looking back 30 years and we see the difference in growth between money that just sat in a savings account versus one that was invested. We don't have to look too hard to see that the $10,000 that was invested grew to almost $150,000, whereas the $10,000 that sat in a savings account grew to $20,000. That's the power of compounding interest. That's the power of having your money working just as hard as you do. Yeah. No, I, I love that, M Michelle. I'll come into you know these conversations with women investors and they'll have extra savings or, and I say, okay, what's the purpose of that? They're like, oh, it's probably should be an investment account, right? Um, I don't know how to do it. I, I'm not sure where to start. So just know that there are a lot of different options. You can do it yourself. There is a digitally managed account, robo-advisor, and you, you can start with $50 in there. I mean, you don't have to have thousands of dollars. We have professionally managed accounts that are tax efficient. So I bring up that regardless of where you are in savings and as you're thinking about these things, we can help you. We can help you to grow the money. You don't have to be an expert in this. We did a deep dive in managed accounts and it's a great conversation just to demystify and answer questions and help to understand different ways to manage things. And I'll end with this that they always say like, don't put all your eggs in one basket when you think about like investing, I also think about types of investments. So Alex and I talked about all these different types of ways of saving, an HSA, a 401k, a non-retirement account. It's so good to have different ways of saving, right, for retirement so you have a lot of flexibility later. So again, come talk to us. We'll help you to figure out the right way to do it. But investing your money is very just as important. Okay, so we've been talking about saving for retirement, accumulating, building, getting to that milestone. Let's talk just for a little bit um, quickly about planning to live in retirement. What do we need to think about for transitioning into retirement itself? Because I know some folks are probably a little closer than others. Gina, can you jump in on that? Yeah, definitely. Prior to having conversations, and again, the conversations we have with you are all complimentary, they're free. Clients come in, hey, I wanna prepare for retirement, what do I need to do? I'll send a checklist. I love a checklist. I make a checklist every day of things I should do daily or bigger long-term ones. So I'll send you a checklist to prepare yourself. So when I think about the successful retirement income planning, I think about different types of expenses. So the first thing I'm going to say is, how much are we going to need in retirement? Let's do some inventory. And this is a big one. So I talked about this in the beginning of our call today, our essential versus our discretionary expenses. And the essentials are those non-negotiables, housing, food, utilities, healthcare, taxes. I mean, I'm going to tell you, I actually love to put other things like some vacations in there or non-negotiables to me. So just know the essentials are what's essential to you to retire. Gina, I'd rather work another year than have to go without traveling in retirement. 
just an example. I'm a big believer in having guaranteed income sources to take care of these things. So we think about social security, pensions, income annuities, things that you don't have to worry about market volatility that you're always going to get a check in the mail to take care of these things. So when we're preparing and having these conversations, just know it's a big part is really breaking down how much do I need and what is really essential to me. And then we have the discretionary things, the fun, the extra fun. Um, those are things that are 401ks or IRAs, the brokerage account, all the savings that can help to take care of those. I know right in front of you as we're prepping for these conversations, I want you to know, I try to help you to figure out how do we recreate these paychecks. It's so hard to go from saving and growing your accounts to shifting to now spending. It's really hard to think about depleting or, or kind of spending some of the money that you've worked really hard to save. But a big way, again, maybe five years out from retirement, we're going to really hone in on ways in which you can have strategies to help to take care of the income that in which you need. Another topic, so th these are all these preparing. So Michelle, you asked, how are we preparing for retirement? So one is like, how do we pay ourselves, right? That's a big one. The other one is, what about the medical piece? I'll have individuals come in and I'll say, when do you want to retire? And they give me arbitrary numbers. They're like, I don't know, 65. I think that's what I'm supposed to. Well, 65 is when Medicare starts, our government plan, healthcare, or healthcare plan. And so sometimes we just hear the number and we think, oh, that's when I should retire. Just know it's a little different coming to us. And we're going to talk a little about Medicare. We also have Medicare specialists here. They're really here to help us to understand healthcare and retirement. State by state, things can be different. So again, they're national, they're all over the country. I always want clients to be well-educated and I think not having surprises in retirement are great. I know healthcare costs and long-term care costs are a big part too. So these are other things to consider. So how do I pay myself? How do I pay for medical? How do I take care of long-term care costs? So we'll talk through those pieces. There's many different options to do it, maybe self-insuring or buy insurance. I also ask clients, what happens? What do you want from an estate planning standpoint? Have we thought about how you want money to be passed on after you're no longer here? And we'll talk through that. We have conversations around social security. When should I take it? It's probably one of the bigger questions I get. Um, and how does it work? Um, what about the rules? We keep talking about saving and what about those required minimum distributions? When do those start? So I think the biggest things that we keep kind of reiterating about retirement planning for you today is that our goal is to give you the hierarchy and how to save. And then when you get there, come in, talk to someone like myself. I send you a checklist. I tell you all the things we're going to do. I try to help us map out. I think the biggest thing I can always reiterate is that I don't want you to have a lot of surprises. You know, if I can help to prepare you, you have less surprises in retirement. And then lastly, I'll just throw this last one in here too, is um, family conversations, right? So maybe you're really, you're a lot younger or maybe you're in retirement, but maybe you're having these conversations with your family around um, their wishes, maybe ailing parents. There's other things you're thinking of. We also have a lot of um, pieces and documents on family conversations and how to get through some of those tough things too, so... I know I just said so much. <laughs> I was just going to say, talk to us. I'm going to help you. We'll we'll figure it all out. All of us, we're here to help you. And and really, at the end of the day, it's everybody's situation's different. So we're here to prepare you and make sure you know what to expect. Yeah, Dina, thank you for, I know you just said a lot. And we you mentioned, we did a whole session on retirement income planning. So that what is that plan for living in retirement look like? We've done estate planning. I mean, these are all big bucket topics that we could spend a lot of time on. In fact, um, and I think you wrapped up well the kinds of topics we can help you with. Again, pick up the phone. We'll give you a call if you want to start talking about or you have more questions or want to start putting a plan in place yourself. Um, Alex, I know we were going to talk a little bit more about emergency savings. I think we are out of time. So we will come back to that in another session. But I just wanted to say thank you so much, both of you. You are rock stars. We so appreciate having you part of Women Talk Money. Thank you all for tuning in. Have a great day.